Thanks, I'm gonna go first. And before I do, I just want to say a big thanks to the good folks at Mysterious Bookshop, to Ian, to Otto. Where are you, Otto? He's hiding. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say that Otto was very nice to me very early in my career. He wrote a uh, Amazon.com special pick or something for my first book. But I, I would hate to blame him for my subsequent career. <laughs> um, but anyhow, thanks to thanks to you folks for, for hosting this, and thanks to my pals here, uh, and thanks to you for coming all this way. Um, so I'm going to read the very beginning of my brand new novel. It's the fourth one in the series, and the nice thing about reading the first several pages <coughs> is that it needs absolutely no <coughs> setup. Detective Jack Leitner was struggling to extricate half a bagel from his toaster when the doorbell rang. It was a day off from work, and he just wanted to sit in his kitchen and eat breakfast in peace. He was tempted to ignore the bell, but it rang again. As he walked out of his kitchen, half his mind was preoccupied with remembering to unplug the toaster before sticking a fork in, and the other half was busy imagining what might happen if he didn't. Electrocution was a pretty rare cause of death, yet he had seen a few startling examples in his years with Brooklyn South Homicide. The hallway of the house he shared with his elderly landlord was musty and carpeted with a layer of astroturf. Mr. Gardner was a home fixer-upper, but he tended to improvise with found materials. I actually had a, a landlord who did that. <laughs> The whole car, the, the hallway of our house carpeted with astroturf, including the little mail slot. <laughs> um, as Jack approached the door, he saw a vague figure standing outside beyond the frosted glass. The mailman? No, it was Sunday. He shook his head. Maybe a Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> he opened the door. Yes? A stranger stood there, a middle-aged, stoop-shouldered black man several inches taller than Jack. He wore black pants, a white shirt, and a frayed gray, gray windbreaker. Are you Jack Leitner? The man's cheeks were spotted with dark freckles, and the skin under his eyes was droopy. He looked like he had seen more than a few miles of bad road. That's right, Jack said. How can I help you? He lived in the quiet Brooklyn neighborhood of Midwood. One of its benefits was that unexpected visits were rare. Could I take a minute of your time? I don't mean to bother you. Jack frowned. In his experience, people who said that they didn't mean to bother you actually meant to do just that. Are you selling something? I'm sorry, but I'm not interested. No, sir, the man replied. I'm not selling anything at all. Would you mind if I come in for just a minute? Jack crossed his arms. Why don't you just tell me what this is about? The man bowed his head for a moment, and then he raised it. With all respect, I don't think this is something you'll want to discuss out here on the stoop. Jack didn't like the sound of that. It was something he often said before breaking the news to relatives of homicide victims. I don't generally invite strangers into my home unless I know what they want. The man stared at him for a moment, then sighed and shook his head. Of course not. I wouldn't either. He looked away for a moment and watched a neighbor trundle his shopping cart down the street. The day was bright and sunny, and a dogwood tree was blossoming above the sidewalk. Later, when Jack recalled this day, he would envision this splash of pink, like a bomb going off. The stranger turned back. I don't suppose you recognize me. I didn't think you would. Jack's first thought was of the 45 service revolver sitting on top of his bedroom dresser. As one of only about 100 NYPD members of service who had earned the designation Detective First Grade, and one of the most seasoned and determined of that elite bunch, he had helped send quite a number of men to prison. Very few had been accepting of their fate. Excuse me for a second, he said. I left something on the stove. I'll be right back. I'll wait, the stranger replied. Jack ducked back into his apartment, grabbed his handcuffs and crammed them in his back pocket, and stuck the 45 in a pocket of his sweatshirt. It looked pretty obvious in there, which was fine with him. He returned to the front door. 
The stranger was sitting on the stoop. He turned to stare up at the detective and immediately took in the new situation. I don't think you're going to need the piece. I'd just like to talk to you. Are you familiar with Alcoholics Anonymous? Jack nodded. Why? The stranger took a wrinkled piece of paper from his pocket, lifted it close to his mournful eyes, and read aloud. Step eight. We made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Step nine. We made direct amends to such people whenever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Jack felt his throat tighten. Who are you? What do you want? The man folded the piece of paper and stuck it back in his pocket. He placed his hands carefully on his knees, looked away, and cleared his throat. When he looked back at Jack, his eyes were troubled and piercing. You had a brother, he said. I believe his name was Peter. I was the boy who killed him. <laughs>